Well, we're glad, glad to be back and uh, glad to be here with you to worship together tonight. And uh, we had a great week or great summer, I guess, uh, this this summer as we were away and a lot of different things. And I was on a mission trip over to Italy, and it was just a great opportunity to see God work in, in southern Italy and what he's doing there and the church there. And uh, Boy, we saw hundreds of people get saved, whether it was in outdoor services or even at churches or on the streets. And so uh, that was an awesome opportunity uh, for us or for me to be there. And I got home a couple weeks at my parents' house, so that meant I did, you know, 10-hour days renovating for two weeks. So that was a great vacation. <clears throat> but uh, uh, it was great to be able to be with them and in their home for two weeks and see how they're doing and uh, be able to work around their place and get some things done. And then uh, came back, and Andrea and I went down to Bethel, uh, down in Redding, California. You know, when you think of Bethel, or at least in my mind, when I thought of Bethel, and you see Bethel music, and all their phenomenal videos, and all the, you think Bethel's got to be in this, in Redding, California, has got to be this fantastic city. It's in the middle of nowhere, and it's like 80,000 people. Red Deer's bigger than than, than Reading, <laughs> and uh, it was a real letdown as far as the city, but the church, that was awesome. Uh, we got to experience the Holy Spirit and just really be refreshed and encouraged. I asked Andrew if she wanted to share something about uh, being down there and what God did while we were down there, and so uh, she's just going to maybe say a couple things. Am I on? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, of, of the sabbatical time, the best part, there was two best parts for me. And one was we were supposed to be on sabbatical two years ago in 2020. And uh, Brielle would have been in grade 12. But um, with COVID, we ended up not having sabbatical till this summer. And this ended up being Brielle's last summer before she goes through 18 months of schooling, where she's not going to be home for any summers at all. So I just really appreciated the Heavenly Father's heart and his timing that it happened during this time that I could spend so much time with her. She ended up having some pretty serious health issues. So I was able to 100% be a mom for a lot of that. So I just uh, am so appreciative to the Lord that he knew that was the right time for us to be, for me to be off. And I just felt like I needed to be home and to be with them. And I didn't go to Italy, but you owe me one, right? Yes, right. Yes, that's <laughs> Uh, no, but it was that was really special for me. And the second best part of being away was our trip to the School of the Prophets in uh, Reading. And again, I kind of had a feeling that it was more like like a Vegas Christian experience or something that you go down there, and it would just be lights and camera and action. It is not. It is a simple church who loves the Lord and goes hard after the deeper things of God. And he has answered every step of the way. Um, I tend to be a little bit discerning when I come into cities of just a heaviness or, or just, just in my spirit, I can feel it. The minute we went into the downtown of Reading, there is a lightness over the city. There is a lightness over that area. We drove forever to get from Sa San Francisco to the city. And San Francisco... Oh, just, just a heads up, never fly into San Francisco is terrible. You don't want to drive out of San Francisco. There is, there is a lot of couches in the ditch. Yeah, it's just bad. More than I've ever seen. And that's not a lie. I don't know if I've ever seen a couch in a ditch here. But once you get into Reading, and this is the thing. They've been there for about 20 years, right? But they have prayed over the city. They have practiced um, what God has asked them to do both inside the walls of the church and outside the walls of the church. They continually pour into that city. Uh, they do spiritual warfare, not just for the people that come into the, the church walls, but they do spiritual warfare on the streets. They do it um, at Safeway. They do it, you know, like I think sometimes to the point where they're just like, oh, it's somebody from Bethel. But this is the thing is that it has made the city so light. It has made the city feel like it's a city of God. And um, uh, it's not a special city on the natural, but you can really feel that God is at work there. Um, the whole four and a half days of our course was on the activation of uh, your prophetic gift. And basically that was just learning, um, hearing the voice of God and what that looks like. And you know, I could maybe speak on it one day, like all of the bazillion things that I learned. <laughs> you don't have time for me to do that. No. Not tonight. <laughs> um, 
But I think the biggest um, joy to me was being raised in a pretty uh, Pentecostal experience home. I had heard a lot about the prophetic from my dad and from my mom, uh, from being in small groups and all of these different experiences. And to go there and to see a church that is radically um, uh, activating that in the people's lives that attend there was really beautiful. And it is not in a way that is wacko. And it is in a way that is very respectful to the voice of God. So whether we were in a class and there'd be 50 of us and they'd go around and say, do you have a word for the person beside you? At first you were like, oh my goodness, I don't have like a four page word for the person beside me. But what they teach you is that sometimes we're discerning and being sensitive to a lot of things that are very much coming from our Heavenly Father, from the Holy Spirit speaking into our heart. And it's just a matter of encouraging that person with that word and it's not so much a thus saith the Lord it's your heart the spirit speaking to your heart speaking to their heart I have never been more encouraged from somebody speaking into my life than in that setting and I think it's because they're just so much encouraging people to hear from the voice of God and when they hear to to step out and to say that and pray that over that person. So um, I just thought it was beautiful and it was a confirmation of some of the things I grew up with that, um, you know, the Lord does speak to us and he does speak to us in a way that can change people's lives. So that was the, the I know I'm going way too long, but that was my heart. That was what I came out and just feeling so encouraged as a person, like as Andrea Williams, that the Lord saw me there and that he sent people to send me little words of of encouragement that God sees me. And I just came back with, you know what? I want that for us. I want to be able to, to share that and teach that and experience that at BP Church because I think that is for everyone to experience. So, yeah, yeah. that was my favorite part. That was awesome. That's point two of my sermon, so it's, it's all good. <clears throat> well, I got a couple of things just before I jump into the message on John chapter 16. And if you have your Bibles, you can you can get there and get ready. Uh, we'll, we'll jump through the middle of John 16 and we'll, we'll look at both ends of it. But... Uh, uh, this weekend, uh, just yesterday or two days ago, last night and tonight, one of our uh, missionaries that we support, Stephen Evans, is in Mozambique. And I had memorized how to say this word, but now I can't say it. Um, I know it looks like Quellamain, but it's not. <laughs> That's it. How do you say it? Kelly Manny, man, it's even a little bit different than that. But anyway, this place, <laughs> uh, this weekend, they've, they've been there uh, doing evangelism. Stephen, if you remember, was here in January with us. Uh, they do have done a lot of stuff for the last 15 years in Latin America. And Stephen was mentored by Reinhard Bonnke. And uh, so when Reinhardt passed away, uh, Stephen felt in his spirit it was time to go back to Africa. As long as Reinhardt was alive, he never had that impression in his heart. But when Reinhardt passed away, all of a sudden, Stephen said, you know, it just kind of came alive. I got to go back to Africa. And so he went a couple of times just checking some things out. And, and uh, so this is the second time being in this city. And they have just seen God move in supernatural ways. He's been sending me a bunch of reports. And this was the altar response uh, two nights ago. Uh, and then last night, uh, the altar response. You can see that tent over to the left-hand side, or right-hand side from the stage, left-hand side of the crowd. That tent is the deliverance tent. Now, this area uh, of... Uh, Mozambique still has a lot of witchcraft and still has a lot of uh, demonic activity. And they've been, the, the deliverance tent has been overrun uh, with people just being set free. So much so that they had teams set up to do it, but they had to go call the pastors to get more people to come to the deliverance tent to help them because of witchcraft being so strong in that area and people being set free. And so uh, he sent me this and he sent me another, another one of tonight, but uh, he just said, man, tell your congregation, thanks for praying for us. Uh, and we're just seeing God have tremendous breakthrough in Mozambique. And so uh, keep praying for them. 
Uh, we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit uh, as Jesus describes the work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. Uh, in John chapter 16, it starts out with uh, a couple of passages of Scripture that kind of set the scene. Oh, before I get there, i got my phone in my hand for a reason. Um, September 24th, I wanted to let you know this, and we're going to start promoting this. September the 24th. At 6 p.m., which is a Sunday evening, we are going to do a celebration for our Advancing the Kingdom, uh, our <clears throat> program to buy the land for our new facility that we're going to build in the future. And uh, we're going to do a, a celebration night where we talk about what God has done, where we're at. And by then, we're going to have a bunch of new plans drawn up, and uh, you're going to be able to see those. And also, Melkor's, I was supposed to meet with Melkor, our developer, on Friday, but that got pushed to this week, so I was going to give more to be able to tell you, but Melkor should be moving the dirt by then, and we should have uh, our utilities put in by next summer. But we're going to talk more about that that night. But the reason I bring this up is because we're going to make it a ticketed event because we have a special guest speaker coming in. I'm going to tie this into my sermon here a little bit later, but uh, when we were talking as a board, we're sitting and we're talking about the future and the fall, and we wanted to do an update on where we're at and what God's been doing and the things that have happened and the giving and everything around that. Uh, we said, well, why don't we do another opportunity to get together, bring everybody together that wants to come, do a banquet, and, you know, encourage people. And we talked about, well, what should we do, and who should we have? Should we have a guest speaker? And talked about vision. And, and the fact that people, and I'm, this, was, again, will be in, in my message here, but people need to have God vision. Not just man vision that we can accomplish on our own. But God vision, something that God lays in your heart that you run towards and you don't let anything steal it away. And, and I thought, man, who's the best person that I've ever heard talk about vision? Vision and accomplishing what God asks you to do. And, and there's this one individual by the, by the name of Tommy Barnett. I don't know if anybody knows who Tommy Barnett is. Tommy uh, was a pastor of First Assembly Phoenix down in Phoenix, Arizona, which is now called Dream City Church. But he's also the individual, him and his youngest son, Matthew, that launched the L.A. Dream Center. The L.A. Dream Center is a place where our youth have been to for a number of missions trips. But uh, it's a place where people just get set free. They come off the streets. And, and God opened that door up supernaturally for their son, Matthew. Between the L.A. Dream Center and Angelus Temple, if you know what Angelus Temple is, uh, it's where Amy Simple McPherson used to be the pastor in L.A. And, uh, but anyway, between the two of these, between the L.A. Dream Center, which was an old hospital in L.A., and the, the Angelus Temple, <clears throat> it's, it's like $100 million worth of property that was literally given to them. Because they chased a dream that God had put in their heart. And today, thousands of people have been set free, set free through them chasing that dream. So I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if we could get him to come and be part of this banquet? So I have a friend that's close to him. And so I sent in a request. And he said yes. And so uh, Pastor Burnett is going to be here with us on September the 24th. And uh, so I want you to begin to plan for that, think about that. And uh, if you're able to make it out that night, uh, we're just going to have a great time talking about what it means to see God give you a vision and see you run with that vision to see it accomplished in your life. So anyway... Put that in your back of your mind. September 24th, we'll be talking more about it. John chapter 16, John, or Jesus starts out in, in John 15. As he closes 15, he talks about Holy Spirit and introduces this idea of Holy Spirit as advocate. And the advocate will come. And then he jumps into this thought process of how persecuted the people are going to, his disciples are going to be. He says, they will put you, in, uh, put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. So he's telling his disciples, there's some bad days coming. Uh, there's some things that are going to happen in your life that people are actually going to think that they're honoring God by hurting you. And, and there's a shift beginning to take now in Jesus' journey where he's been discipling his disciples and walking with these disciples. Now he's preparing his disciples for him to go to the cross and then ascend into heaven. And this is kind of a bridge chapter between where, what we've seen, the story of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, him preparing his disciples for him going to the cross and what's going to happen after the cross and after the resurrection. 
He, he goes on and he talks about the advocate will come. He has to leave. We're going to look at this in more detail in just a moment. But he has to leave. But the advocate, Holy Spirit, is going to come. And, and when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to be the one that works in humanity's lives, in, in our lives. Now, he jumps down to the after he talks about this and he talks to them about when they pray, there's something new is going to happen after the Holy Spirit comes. He talks about him going to the cross or leaving and coming back and their joy being made full. And he talks to him about using his name in prayer. He says, at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly and he will grant your request because you use my name. He says, up till this time, uh, you haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. So Jesus is talking about the authority that we are going to have after he went to the cross and was resurrected again and that we were going to be able to access God directly. Now, we you know, as Christians today, we think, well, yeah, that's, that's normal, that's simple. But think about who he's talking to. He's talking to the Jewish people that always went through a priest to get to God. And at this time, the disciples were going through Jesus to get to God. Because he had become their teacher, and we understand him to become the great high priest. But Jesus says to his disciples, there's not going to be anything in the way for you anymore to access the presence of God that he was going to accomplish this through what he was just telling them about. And he goes on in the very end of the chapter, and this passage of scripture, you've probably heard it before if you've been around church very much. He says, I have told you these things so that in, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I've overcome the world. In this world, you're going to face all kinds of stuff. Remember, he starts this chapter or this thought process uh, with after talking about the pruning of the tree and everything. He jumps into Holy Spirit coming and he starts it with, you're going to face all kinds of persecution. You're going to face all kinds of trouble. You're going to go through all kinds of stuff. And then a little bit later on, he goes, but I'm going to give you the opportunity and the availability to step into God's presence and go straight to God with your requests and make them known. Step straight into his presence. And in my name, you're going to see things happen. Now, we just sang in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we're going to see things happen because we have access into God's presence. And then he finishes the thought process off with, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, because I've overcome it all, so can you. And it's a real assurance for his disciples as they're walking through what's about to happen in their life. Now, we want to talk about what Jesus talks about, the work of the Holy Spirit, how we're going to be able to go through life, and how we're going to be able to face the difficulties of life. In John 16... <clears throat> excuse me, 7 through 15 is what we're going to focus on. He says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So he's telling him, I've got to leave you, but the advocate. And the word here, advocate, some translations say counselor. But it's better, actually the word better translated is advocate in a legal sense. In a, it's a legal terminology of the day. The advocate would work on their behalf. An advocate stands up for you. An advocate is that helper working on your behalf to, to, to step in with you to help you through certain search, search, situations, <laughs> certain circumstances. I was trying to get two S's together or C's. But anyway, get through these circumstances in life. And he says, this helper is going to come and be with you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me. Jesus had been talking about sin. Remember, John the Baptist was, was the one crying out for repentance and preparing the way for Jesus. And, and Jesus followed up with John and was showing the world what it meant to live right with God and, and showing the world who God is and who God could be through humanity. And he says, people don't believe in me. People don't believe in who I am. So the Holy Spirit is going to teach them about sin. 
about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you can see me no more. So they're not going to see my example. You're not going to see my example anymore. I'm going to the Father, but Holy Spirit is going to be with you to speak into your life. And about judgment because the prince of this world stands condemned. And and I love this piece at the end of what he says about what the work of the Holy Spirit, that the prince of this world stands condemned because at this point, Satan had been condemned for his actions and Jesus was going to the cross to take back the authority that he had taken from humanity or that humanity had given up to him. And he stands condemned, meaning that what God has said, he's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change his mind about what it means about sin or what righteousness is. Satan is condemned. And Jesus was going to the cross. So I believe that still jumps forward to today, that what Jesus said was sin is still sin today. What Scripture says is sin is still sin. No matter what. Culture might embrace sin, but if it's contrary to the Word of God, It's sin. And Holy Spirit is still going to convict of sin. Now, whether we want to listen or not, it's still sin. Most of you agree. 99% are nodding yes. Some are like, where's he going? Where's he going? Is he going to touch on that one? No. All you got to do is read your Bible. And if it's there, it's still sin today. It is. He stands condemned. So there's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. That's his job. It's his job to convict, not mine. It's not my job to judge. It's it's simply my job to live righteous, right? That's our job is to live in right standing with God. That's what Jesus makes available to us by his death on the cross and his resurrection, that our sin could be forgiven and that we could walk in his righteousness and continuously apply his righteousness to our life. Yes, when we sin, we simply confess our sin and we say, Jesus, forgive me of that. And he is faithful to forgive us of our sin that we can walk in righteousness. But we have to hear Holy Spirit convict us in those moments in order for us to walk away from sin. That's his job. He convicts us. So the work of the Holy Spirit in you and me and humanity first is this convicting work of where we're at and where God wants us to be. He goes on in verse 12. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when he, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He'll guide you into what really is truth and what God's heart for humanity is. He's going to continuously speak into your life. Uh, It was interesting when I was in in Italy and we were in a place called Reggio Calabrio. Uh, Reggio Calabrio was just way down at the very bottom of Italy and by the channel in Sicily is right on the other side. And if any of you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I, I sent a couple of pictures from that. We were in an outdoor amphitheater. And this outdoor amphitheater faced Sicily. And so it was a really cool place, but it was right on this big boardwalk and there was hundreds, thousands of people all over the place. And we filled this amphitheater and and then my buddy Tommy that I was there with was up preaching and I I was sitting over to the side just kind of praying and and watching the crowd and just enjoying myself and because nobody knew how I was and I wasn't in charge of anything and I was just there having fun. So it was great. (coughs) And uh, so I'm just sitting there looking like I'm just a regular Italian sitting on the side. And I see this family because tons of people were, you know, bicycles going by, people walking by, and they'd come up and they'd realize there's somebody on this massive stage with all these lights and they'd look for a way and they'd go around the back. But this one family comes along and you could tell this lady, it was two couples, and you could tell this lady heard him speaking and everybody else was about to walk around the back and she said, no, come here. And so she made them all come to the side of the platform with her. And they were talking, but she was intently listening. And then all of a sudden, the other three started listening along with her. And I'm sitting there, and, you know, Tommy's one of those long-winded preachers. And so it's good because they weren't listening for the first 15 minutes. (laughs) But then they started listening. And you could see a change. And all of a sudden, you could tell Holy Spirit was now speaking to them. 
Because all of a sudden, the guy that was with the lady that was intently made them stay, all of a sudden you could see him going, hmm, and nodding his head every once in a while. And then the other couple, you could see them all of a sudden begin to listen more intently. Well, by the end of it, when Tommy gave the altar call, they were one of the first ones to walk up because the Holy Spirit began to speak into their heart. The Holy Spirit began to say something to them. He says, I have much more to tell you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to lead you into truth. See, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict us, and then it's the Holy Spirit's job to lead us into truth. And we understand that truth to be Jesus and who Jesus is and what Jesus has made available to us. It's that teaching work. He teaches us all things and he helps us to understand what Jesus has made available. In John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to Jesus. I am the truth. And when Jesus says the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, meaning that Holy Spirit will lead humanity into the understanding of who Jesus is and what he's made available to them. Now, our job as believers, once we've experienced the truth, is to live out that truth and talk about that truth and show that truth so that others can see that truth. And it's Holy Spirit's job to convict them and lead them into the truth. All we can do is show the truth, speak the truth, be the truth. Holy Spirit does everything else. Don't get caught up in, man, I, I can't get my, my friend saved, or I can't get my family member saved, or I can't. No, you can't. But Holy Spirit can. Holy Spirit can. That's literally his job. That's literally his job. But it is our responsibility to show the world who Jesus is. In, in John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. The flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. That means that the flesh, there is no work that the flesh can do to give new life. There, there is no thing that you can do on your own or me on my own to step into the kingdom of God. It can't be done through the flesh. It can't be done through works. It has to be done through the spirit. So the spirit comes, the spirit convicts, the spirit leads us into truth and the spirit, Holy Spirit, regenerates us, gives us new life. He gives birth to us. He moves us. And Jesus says, the advocate has to come. He said, I have to leave because the advocate's going to come and that's going to change everything. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to make the world a different place. He's going to make humanity different. Humanity is going to align back up with what I originally created it to be because humanity can't do it on its own. Holy humanity needs my spirit in them to become what I've created them to be. In John chapter 16, verse 13, he goes on and he says, and he will not speak of his own. He will only speak what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He'll tell you what is yet to come. I love this. And I read a lot of different commentaries on this and different thoughts on this. And, and all of them have the same thing uh, in that it is a prophetic thought that Jesus is presenting here. It's that he will show you things yet to come. He will talk about what I have in store for you. And remember, Jesus actually starts this whole conversation with telling the disciples what was about to come that they were going to be persecuted, that there was going to be people that were going to kick them out of the synagogues. There's going to be people that feel that they're honoring God by killing them and by persecuting them. He's prophetically telling them what they're about to face. And he tells them, there's more things that I would tell you, but right now you can't handle it. But I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. He's going to be your advocate. He's going to work on your behalf. And he is also going to do what I have done when I'm with you. He's going to tell you what is yet to come. He's going to give you vision for your own life. But it's not just man's vision, it's God's vision. 
It's God's thought process. It's what God sees you as and what God sees you doing and the things that God has in store for you. He's also going to speak into your life just like I've spoken into your life so that you can speak into other people's lives where you can speak a prophetic word into their life, where you can reveal things to them. It's the revelation work of the Holy Spirit. He's got this teaching work and he's got this convicting work and he's got this revelation work where he speaks spirit to spirit in our lives. He regenerates our spirit. He gives us new birth and he speaks into our lives. But we have to have ears to hear him. We have to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Because when he speaks, he gives us instruction. He moves us in the direction of God's heart for us and for others around us. See, the revelation work of who Jesus is is what he has made available for us. The revelation work of what Jesus excuse me, has done for us, Holy Spirit brings into our life. In Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3, when, when Jesus is speaking to John about the church and he's telling them, hey, say this to the churches. At the end of every church, he says, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying, what the Spirit is convicting, what the Spirit is teaching, what the Spirit is calling forth, or what the Spirit is saying is to come. And I would say that to you this weekend. Whoever has ears, be attentive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Individually, and then corporately. So if you want to break it down, individually, what Holy Spirit are you saying to me? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to my family? Holy Spirit, what are you saying in my workplace? Holy Spirit, as you guys are going back to school, literally, Holy Spirit, what are you saying about my school that I should be attentive for for this year? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? And for a church, it's Holy Spirit, what are you saying to us about Calgary? What are you saying to us about Bennington, about Huntington, about Evanston, about Royal Oak. That's where I live. I'm a little bit further away, but what are you saying about Country Hills? What are you saying about Panorama? What are you saying, Holy Spirit? And when Andrew and I went to Bethel, when we were driving from, we had flew into San Francisco because it was so much cheaper. And we're driving out, and the traffic is just insane coming out of San Francisco at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. You know, stupid time to fly in, but it's my fault. <clears throat> but anyway, as we're coming out and we're talking and we're driving and we're driving up to Reading and, and I, I said to Andrew, before we got to Reading, I said, you know, it'll be really interesting. She said, I wonder, she said, I wonder, you know, what the city's going to feel like with this type of church. And, and I said, yeah, and I said, I wonder if they're just a big international church that has influence all around the world, but they haven't influenced their city. Because that happens. We get more focused somewhere else than we really get focused on where God has put us. And I said, well, it'll be interesting to see what type of ministries they really have in their city. Well, uh, I was blown away by the ministries they have in their city. I really was. Uh, and that's why their city... And one of the things that... Um, Chris Vallotton said, Chris Vallotton is, is the prophetic, uh, in charge of the prophetic ministry for the church, the prophet of the house. And, and uh, he, he said, you know, one of the things that God really spoke to us about, Holy Spirit spoke to the church, is that we can't just talk about it. We have to be it. We can't talk about city transformation or world transformation or without doing it in our own city. And he said, so their ministries have been designed around that and the things that they do. And, and even got to the point about where God convicted them or spoke to them and said, you need to help the city government uh, and, and to invest into the city. So they tithe uh, a portion of, so they give 1% of their 10%. They tithe on the income to the church, the same as we do. They give it away to different ministries and different areas of the world, but they take 1% of their 10% and they give it to the city council. I thought, wow, 
That's interesting. <clears throat> so he said, it was a very interesting conversation. He said, we called up the city, city manager and said, hey, could we come talk with you? And the city manager said, sure. And so we went in to talk with the city manager. And, you know, the city manager, he, he said, the city manager thought we were coming to ask for something. And he said, so we went into him and he said, hey, we would like to give you $100,000. And the city manager said, what? Why do you want to give us $100,000? And what's the strings attached to it? Now, typically, that's what the church would say to the government, right? What's the strings attached? But the government now is saying to the church, well, what's the strings attached? And he said, well, no strings attached. Uh, we just once a year want you to tell us what you did with it. And he's like, okay. And he said it was a weird meeting for the first couple of years. And, but he said, we also told him, and if there's other things that come out that the city needs... Let us know, and we want to be part of the solution in our city if we can help. And he said, so after a couple of years, they actually said, well, yeah, you know, we have a park that we've been trying to finish off for the last three years, and we think it's going to take us another three years to do it. And he said, would you guys be able to help us out with that? And, and Chris said, you know, well, what's the cost? And they told him it was a, you know, 20, 30,000. I can't remember how much it was. And, and so he said, okay. And uh, he said, well, I'll, we will give this amount of money to it, but we have 5,000 students in our school. And when they come back, we will put them all to work. And so the 5,000 students in their school for a couple of weeks logged hundreds and thousands of hours building this park that the city had struggled so much to get done. And because of that, they logged so many hours that they won the award for the most volunteer hours in a city in the U.S., and they got a $10 million award from the federal government for logging so many hours. <laughs> so that was a church saying, let's just not talk about it. Let's get involved. And let's show the world who Jesus has called us to be. Let's be the church that listens to the voice of the Holy Spirit and be engaged in our community. And there's all kinds of other things, of course, that they do. Uh, I won't go into all of them, but I was so impressed that they're not just this ministry that has influence all over the world, but they've taken the responsibility of what the Holy Spirit is calling them to do in their city. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. And especially, you know, corporately together, what the Holy Spirit calls us to do in our city. Don't let God plans become good plans because they seem too hard. We go from God vision and God dreams and God ideas to good ideas because they're easier to do. Because God ideas need God. And sometimes it's easier for us to simply do Mark ideas because those don't require God as much. And we do them in our own strength. But Jesus told his disciples, don't get overwhelmed with everything going on because I've given you access into God's presence. And you're going to be able to go into his throne room and make your petitions known in my name. And when you do that, he's going to respond because you used my name. In John 16, Jesus kind of finishes off this thought process with, he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So it's from Jesus that Jesus is going to continuously speak to the disciples' lives through the advocate, through Holy Spirit. He speaks to our lives through his spirit today. All that belongs to the Father <clears throat> is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me and make known to you. Now, we believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Three ways that God has shown himself to humanity. If you just want to break it down easy, it's three ways that God has shown who he is to us. That's my easiest way to understand Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All one but three different ways that we see God and experience God and God shows his love towards us and speaks into our lives and empowers our lives and works in his creation. So Holy Spirit convicts, Holy Spirit teaches, Holy Spirit reveals. I'm out of time.
but I haven't spoken in 10 weeks. So, Holy Spirit empowers. See, I could have stopped there, but Andrea took my time. So. <laughs> Holy Spirit empowers. Holy Spirit empowers. I want, you to, I want that just to drop in your heart. Holy Spirit empowers. He convicts us. And thank you, God, for your conviction. He, he teaches us. Thank you, God, that you didn't leave me like that, that you helped me move forward. And Holy, Holy Spirit continuously moves us in that direction. He speaks into our lives. He teaches. He empowers us to fulfill what it is that he's speaking into our lives. In, in 1 Corinthians, Paul, Paul speaks to the church and he says, we didn't come to you with persuasive words, but we came to you with a demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. The demonstration of power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and through our lives. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus speaking, Luke recording what Jesus had said. Jesus speaking to his disciples, told them to, to wait in Jerusalem and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That I will empower you to do this, to show the world who I am. The work of the Holy Spirit in us prepares the way for the work of the Holy Spirit through us. The work of the Holy Spirit in us, that conviction and that revealing and that teaching, that prepares the way for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit through our lives. And as he continuously convicts us and continuously transforms us and gives us new life and he, he'll continuously empower us, to show the world who he is. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think I locked up. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 11, talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the different gifts that we have. I'll just read it out to you the best I can. There we go. <clears throat> now to each one, a manifestation of the, of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's, Holy Spirit works in us for others. It's not just for me. It's for the common good. To one, oh, and, and in this passage of Scripture, one thing that's interesting, because he keeps talking about the same spirit, same spirit. Uh, they had polytheism big time in Corinth and in that area, and, and they believed in all of these many different gods. And, and there was becoming a thought process of, well, well, you have the spirit of prophecy, but you have the spirit of healing, and you have the spirit of this. And, you, and Paul is bringing some correction to that of it's one spirit. It's God's spirit. His spirit does all of this in our lives. So that's why he keeps saying this, the same spirit. He says, now to each one a manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by the means of the same spirit. To another faith by the same spirit. To another uh, gifts of healing by the same spirit. Uh, by that one spirit to another miraculous powers, another prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits to another speaking different kinds of tongues, all the same spirit, all Holy spirit and still another interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, when Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 13, and he will speak not of his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He's talking about those gifts of the Spirit that are miraculous in nature, miraculous in that we can't know it on our own, where he speaks through us. And understand, in Revelation, Jesus speaks to uh, John when he's talking about prophecy and <clears throat> First of all, prophecy is two things. The, the word prophecy itself talks about uh, foretelling what's going to happen. Remember, Jesus started John 16 foretelling. Foretelling what's going to happen. This is what you're going to experience. This is what you're going to th go through. And then he, he closes, or he, in the middle of it, he talks about what he's going to do, and that Satan already stands condemned. Now, remember we read that Satan already stands condemned? Jesus had not d died on the cross yet. He's foretelling at that point. He prophesies in the beginning about what's going to happen. He talks about how the world is going to turn on them. And he talks about their joy being stolen from them because he's going to die. But he talks about Satan being condemned. Satan was condemned when Jesus rose again. Because that's when the final verdict 
was put against him. He was condemned when Jesus overcame him. He was, he, he was guilty, but he was condemned to eternity, eternal damnation, when Jesus had victory over him. And here, it's, it's that prophetic word where Jesus speaks that he, stand, he already stands condemned because Jesus knew what he was about to do. Jesus shifts in chapter 16 and 17. He prays for the disciples and the church to come. And in chapter 18, we see the, the path to the cross. And there's a shifting here in chapter 16. But it's that prophecy that Jesus starts with and shows throughout it that he says the Holy Spirit will teach you and speak to you about things that are to come. That you and I would be speaking those same way that Jesus spoke with that same type of authority because he's overcome the world. In Revelation chapter 19, Jesus speaking to John, uh, to the church, and, and he tells John, he says this, for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness of Jesus. The essence of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. If you look at other translations, and the testimony is your testimony about what Jesus has done in your life is the essence of prophecy. It's about what Jesus can do over other people's lives, forth telling into their life. It's about what Jesus can do in their circumstances. It's about what Jesus can lead them into. But the essence of prophecy is revealing Jesus. It's revealing who Jesus is. And it's pointing people to Jesus. That's what it's meant to do. This fall, we're going to uh, teach a course that's going to help with understanding, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but especially drilling down on, you know, words of prophecy, words of wisdom, words of uh, knowledge, uh, words of encouragement, uh, all, of, all of the stuff that kind of comes in that umbrella of prophecy. There was a course that they had as we went through this course. It, was a, it wasn't just a conference. It was literally a class. It was a one-week class started at 8 a.m. every morning and ended at 12, no, at 10 p.m. every evening. All day long. Terrible. <laughs> Wear you right out. But it was great. Some of the best teaching, and, and most of you know I've got a lot of education, but some of the best teaching I have ever heard on prophetic and the use of the prophetic in the church and how the church should use the prophetic in the marketplace some of the best I've ever heard, and so scripturally based. So we're going to take some of that this fall, and one of the members of our church was there, Barbie Sue. Her son-in-law actually is one of the pastors on staff down there. Uh, so she was down there visiting her daughter and grandchildren, and, and so she went to the conference too with us, and so she's going to help teach that class this fall. And uh, if you're interested in that, you feel the Lord leading you in that direction, we're excited to be able to bring this and, and help you to grow in that and see how the Lord wants to use that in your life. And you that are involved in our altar ministry, we're going to ask everybody that's involved in altar ministry uh, to be part of that, uh, just so that we understand the rules around the house uh, about how pro prophecy is supposed to be used or words of encouragement or anything like that, especially when it comes to being praying with people and speaking over people's lives. So just keep that in your mind. We'll announce the time of that. It's probably going to be October somewhere there November November 4th my wife knows more than I do <clears throat> November 4th but the the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness of who Jesus is so Holy Spirit's work the advocate's work in your life is to convict he teaches he reveals and then he empowers and he empowers us to use what he reveals so that the world can see who Jesus really is. And if you're with us this weekend here or you're watching online and you're seeking out spiritual things and you're wondering, you know, is this for me? Is, is this Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is he for me? Well, he will speak into your heart. He will speak into your spirit and he will bring conviction where I can't. And you'll hear me pray this all the time. Holy Spirit, do what I can't do. Convict where conviction is needed. And give reassurance where reassurance is needed. That you love and you care and you desire to be in relationship with us. 
So if that's you this weekend and you're here with us and you don't have that relationship with God that comes through what Jesus has done on the cross where he's defeated Satan and he's defeated his power and his authority and he gives us access to relationship and to live with knowing that God is on our side and he gives us new life through his spirit, I want to give you an opportunity just to step into that. And if one time you were walking in that and you've pushed God aside and you've just been doing it on your own and you're like, right now, Holy Spirit's speaking to you and he's saying, yeah, this is for you. This is for you. I love you. I want to welcome you back. I want to encourage you. In just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray a prayer with me and just invite him back into your life. So whether you're here in the room or you're watching this online, if that's you this weekend, I'm just going to pray a simple prayer and Pastor Ben is going to sing this song real quick and just allow Holy Spirit to speak into your heart. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you. that You are the one that convicts. You are the one that teaches. You are the one that speaks loudly into our lives. And Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I ask you to silence every other voice but the voice of Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, speak loudly into our lives. Convict us where we need to be convicted. And reassure us where we need to be reassured of your love and your grace. God, bring life transformation into us. In Jesus' name, amen. Just let the Holy Spirit speak into your heart as Ben sings this. Your name is
week, Lord, as we go into our, our workplaces, our communities, our homes. God, for those that are getting ready to go back to school or university, Lord, truly give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us. And, and Lord, that boldness to speak out things, Lord, that you lay on our hearts that need to be said so it's not just eloquent words, but it's a demonstration of our God speaking into this world through our lives to encourage and build up people around us. Lord, to show them who you are through our life and to point them to Jesus. In your name we ask. Amen. Amen. Our ministry team is going to be here at the front. And if we can pray with you about anything, we would love to do that. God bless you. Have a great week. We have prayer starting up this Wednesday night uh, at 7 o'clock here in this room. And we're going to be praying for a few minutes here. And then we're going to go over to the field and pray over the field for our big barbecue as we connect with our community uh, next weekend. God bless you. Have a great week.